record this. Um, if for some reason you have questions or concerns that you would not like to be recorded, uh, feel free to talk to me after uh, the presentation, to email me, um, whatever works well for you. Um, so today we're going to be talking about uh, designing equitable courses and thinking specifically about diverse learners. Um, I'm your presenter. Uh, Lindsay, as I said earlier, my pronouns are she, her, hers, um, and I'm one of the new inclusive teaching coordinators here at, for the Center of Innovative Teaching and Learning. Um, I have my contact information um, that I will be sending out to you after this presentation, so if for some reason you want to email me, call me, um, have a have a video call we can set that up and um i can answer questions about this or a lot of other things that have to do with teaching okay let me turn my little video off so that's not distracting anyone um there we go so uh by the end of this workshop we should be able to identify elements of equitable course design, understand how a course's content, assessment, and policies are not neutral, and they might not support or reflect some students' identities, experiences, and needs. And we're going to identify ways to adapt course materials for greater equity. And I want to start out this presentation by saying that uh, we're never going to be able to design the perfect course that meets everybody's needs, that represents everybody in the class. Um, so I think that sometimes people's attitudes towards this is like, I, I'm never going to be able to do the perfect thing. So uh, people can just ad adapt to what I'm doing. Um, and just because it's never gonna be perfect, just because we're always gonna be adjusting doesn't mean that we can't get better. Um, and we're seeing more diverse learners in our classes. And I think that when we talk about diversity, we often think about gender or race and ethnicity or sexuality, but we're, we're also including um, people with diverse uh, experiences uh, we're looking at veterans, we're looking at uh, people who are caretakers that are returning to uh, to school after being out for a while, um, that have disabilities, that are neurodiverse. So uh, we got to make sure that we're thinking about uh, diversity in this expansive way. Um, not necessarily just as far as uh, gender and race and maybe even religion for, for some of you that would be uh, teaching content that would uh, be relevant to that. So when we're thinking about diverse learners, um, as I said earlier, courses are not inherently equitable. Um, when we're creating courses, we're assuming students' knowledge base, we're assuming their needs, and we're assuming their devotion to coursework. And while I would love everybody to be super dedicated to my courses and to uh, think of me as, you know, like this amazing mentor or friend that they want to, you know, like do the work for my class and get it done and everything else comes second, like that's just not realistic. Um, not only with their coursework and other, uh, with their load of work in other classes, but also with the responsibilities that come along with being a human person. Um, so we need to think about designing courses so that students have a greater opportunity to be successful. That's courses that are not assuming that this is the only thing that students have to do, or this is the most important thing that students have to do, um, or that they love the thing that we're doing. Um, and we have to keep in mind that, again, like our, our identities, our social identities, our background, our experiences can also influence the way that we 
learn. So whether or not we see ourselves represented in course uh, materials with experts, with uh, research that's being done in the field, um, or if we have past experiences where uh, we've sort of been broken down by the system told, uh, for my experience as uh, someone who has taught a lot of writing courses, uh, students will often come and say that they're not good at writing because of the feedback that they've received has been so negative. Um, and so that creates this block coming into, um, into my class. Um, students that are um, neurodiverse will often be told that they're lazy or that they need to focus. Um, and so all of these things sort of compound and whether you are directly saying them, uh, these negative things to students or erasing um, their identities or not, students are coming with these, uh, with these thoughts, with these feelings and with these experiences into our classes. Um, and so one great way to help students is to overtly value them as individuals and to recognize their diversity and acknowledge that not everybody's needs are the same. Um, so uh, uh, that's the ground floor is acknowledging that just because you might have a, a group of, let's say, quote unquote, traditional uh, first year students, uh, that their experiences and their identities don't match across the board. And so they're all coming in with different needs, different backgrounds, and different things that they're interested in too. So one way that we attempt to create this equitable uh, learning experience for students is by looking at universal de design. Um, and so that means that courses, uh, that materials assessment are all designed with this idea that uh, we can have uh, flexibility with deadlines. We can be flexible with communication, excuse me, communication and the ways that we engage students. Um, we can give students options for learning, engaging and being assessed. And we can um, create these opportunities for feedback so that students can let us know what's working for them, what's not working for them. And that's going to change um, from student to student, semester to semester. So it's not going to be, OK, I got this feedback once. Now I'm set. I've got this down perfect, right? Um, but allowing students to give you that feedback so that you can reflect and you can fine tune things as necessary is a really big aspect of, of uh, continuing to design courses that are equitable. A big aspect of designing equitable courses is making sure that you have options for communication and connection baked into the course itself. Uh, so making sure that you are upfront offering multiple ways and times for students to approach you, to ask questions, to make requests. So uh, many of us have in-person office hours, or if we're completely online, maybe we have those virtual. Um, but giving students the opportunity to meet with you virtually, even if you have in-person hours, uh, is huge. Maybe your student has uh, to work during your regularly posted office hours or they have another class. Um, so they aren't necessarily able to drop what they're doing in other aspects of their life in order to meet with you then. Um, creating opportunities for students to meet you outside of the office. So even if you have a student that can meet you during these regular times, if, if the student has to go to Zooloff to meet with you one-on-one, -on -one, um, so many students don't know how to access that building, don't understand, um, can't find rooms. 
it's really, really overwhelming. So if you can schedule a time to uh, meet with them in a shared space in an academic building, um, okay, there's a there's a table outside of our regularly uh, our classroom. Let's meet here instead. If you can meet with them in the library or even in the student center and create an environment where they feel more comfortable, um, that's a great option. Also, coming to your office sometimes gives students feelings of like they have to go see the principal, um, and that can like really tap into this uh, like academic um, anxiety for them. So, uh, especially if they haven't developed a great relationship with you yet giving them options to meet with you elsewhere is is uh is great and they're just more likely to to actually talk to you and um feel comfortable having those conversations another option is to uh set up early on um a q a discussion board so uh it might be something that is anonymous but uh if students are asking questions that are relevant for everybody to have those questions posted in a space where you have answers to them is really, really useful. Um, one of the things that I tell students to encourage them to ask questions is if you have the question, probably at least five other people have that question too. And so to normalize asking questions and saying like, oh yeah, that would be a great thing for me to clarify. Let me share that with other people is always a great option. And then if you do have the Q&A discussion board, it might be worth it to uh, point out new questions and answers whenever you meet for class, just to remind students that these exist in this place and that it's useful information, even if they don't necessarily remember that it exists all the time. So we've, uh, talked a lot in um, in the world of education about varying instruction. We talk about uh, some people are visual learners, some people need uh, to physically do something. Um, and there's uh, there's debate over the uh, whether or not that's actually a thing now. And it's a very interesting debate. But what we can, uh, take away from this conversation is that varying activities in order to uh, get information across is good for everybody. Um, getting people to uh, move their bodies or change what they're doing is good, especially when we're sitting in long classes or we've been in class since 8 a.m. Um, so, Presenting information in different um, methods really can help uh, reinforce these concepts and get people to understand them from a different perspective. So you might be doing activities that are reading and writing. You might have uh, students moving around the room, um, physically doing an activity. Um, that could even be uh, in those of us that are teaching uh, writing classes uh cutting up their uh essay and rearranging the the parts of it to make it flow better so like moving pieces of their writing around physically might be something that would be helpful for them obviously if you're teaching in a lab um the moving and touching and doing might be a little bit easier using visual aids like pictures charts graphs having auditory uh parts of of learning so uh including discussions lectures and recordings i think a lot of us are doing this but um there might be this aspect of of uh creating additional content for students to have access to so uh additional youtube videos that help reinforce concepts that they can see in their own time and then also doing cooperative work uh, so that might not necessarily be collaborative, but working together uh, to do discussions uh, with other people in the class, to do group work, uh, low stakes sort of stuff. And uh, providing options for understanding. So using PowerPoints, 
um, tables, figures, images to accompany discussions and lectures. If you're talking about um, the Civil War, for example, actually showing pictures from the Civil War while you're discussing, you know, whether it's, uh, um, you know, artist renditions of uh, representations of the Civil War uh, alongside discussions um, really help students visualize what's going on and lock that information in to, uh, to specific imagery. Um, again, if you can use uh, video recordings or audio recordings, whether it's uh, you recording yourself in the class that day or using additional materials like YouTube videos or podcasts to back up that, uh, that understanding, and even creating a list of terms and definitions to create common language. So it might be uh, that you have students coming into your class and you're assuming that they have a basic understanding of um, the components of writing. But we can't, we can't, we can't assume anything, um, especially when we have students coming in to class when they uh, spent a big chunk of high school in a pandemic learning virtually. Um, so if we can create a bunch of terms and definitions and have this list to uh, have students to refer to, to create uh, links to with YouTube videos or to reinforce with examples. Um, and the same thing could be true for um, math terminology, for terminology and um, in biology, uh, or even in um, my background with uh, gender studies classes. Okay, what's a hierarchy? Let's define that. And we can have this common language to move through the semester with. Those are all great opportunities for us to make sure that students understand, you know, like core concepts, um, but also engage them in, in that learning process and create something that they can refer back to. Creating opportunities for uh, students to work together uh, is a great way for them, again, to engage with materials differently, but also to break up the norm. Um, so many students have to sit and listen to this sage on the stage, and we love this sage. We love all, the, all of the information that they have, but it also helps for them to internalize concepts better and to understand what things aren't clicking for them if we can have them work with groups. So if they can, um, even as individuals or in group at, or with groups in the class, if they can actively practice uh, solutions, actively work on what would be maybe considered homework, um, provide demonstrations or deliver mini lessons so that they can interact with concepts differently, give them low stakes ways to practice whatever we're trying to teach them and also allow them to teach each other um, and they're more likely to ask for clarification or uh, listen in a different way than they would uh, to have you know the um, the instructor on uh, in front of the classroom and listening to a lecture as maybe they would usually do um, and this also allows students to be recognized as individuals in the, within the classroom, um, to uh, create community and to create connections. So they then can help each other as things move on, but also uh, help students feel seen that you recognize that they have something to contribute to class and that it's not a waste of time for them to work through problems or for you to take uh, time away um, from you talking um, to do things that would help them. Assessment is a large component of classes. 
Um, obviously, we want to make sure that students have the content down. Um, and part of, of establishing um, what we're doing and why we're doing that is making sure that students understand the learning objectives for the course and for individual assignments. So how are these individual assignments backing up what they're supposed to be learning overall for the course? And why is that important? It's also important to give uh, students multiple ways to engage with uh, the course content and to demonstrate that they understand and that they have grown um, with their with their skills and their knowledge. So while um, assigning an essay or giving a timed exam might be something um, that that we're used to, uh, giving people variety like, okay, you can create an essay or a video or a podcast to talk about this uh, to talk about this book. Um, giving them the option to create a mini lesson, a children's book, or a PSA might be a great opportunity for them to demonstrate that they understand this uh, concept from um, their education class, for example. Um, if they're going to be critiquing something, write a Yelp review um, about why white supremacy is a bad thing. Um, create a YouTube video or create memes. They can write reflections, blogs, or even social media posts. So students uh, are, are writing and creating content in ways that, you know, 15 years ago, I didn't, uh, I wasn't doing. Um, I wasn't doing regularly. I didn't necessarily think as being um, a way to assess learning, but they can incorporate the things that they already know and demonstrate uh, like like the genre of of a meme um, or or what a vlog is supposed to look like and incorporate concepts from the class to make those opportunities for assessment more interesting and fun for them, um, but also allow students that maybe have a hard time sitting down and writing an essay. Um, an opportunity to uh, to demonstrate that they that they know what's going on and understand, you know, uh, whatever concepts you're trying to get across, but varying um, the assignments a bit. Um, and all I have to say is that, you know, we're I'm not necessarily uh, saying that essays and exams should go away completely. Um, there are definitely spaces and times that that makes the most sense. Um, but if we're checking comprehension and um, if we're trying to show students that there's a connection between the things that they're learning in class and the world outside, these might be um, these might be good options. Along with assessment, obviously, comes component, components of grading. Um, so we want to make sure that if we are creating um, new varying ways of assessing students, or even if we're using um, the old reliable essays and exams, we want to make sure that students understand exactly what they need to do um, in order to earn points. Um, we need to make sure that we're using rubrics that identify where and why points were deducted. Um, and that the assignment sheets that we have for students explain the, the grading rubrics, they explain those learning objectives, and even include checklists of things to include or complete. Uh, that might be combined with the with the rubric. You might, you know, uh, create a rubric that they check things off and then you um, fill out information on. Uh, there are a variety of ways to do that. Um, along with gr grading comes due dates. So uh, what we're seeing more and more is that 
again, students aren't necessarily in only students right now. Um, a lot of students work, a lot of students work multiple jobs, have caretaking um, responsibilities. And around midterms, we'll have four or five things due roughly the same few days. So creating opportunities for students to turn in things um, after the initial deadline is huge. Uh, or allowing them to turn things in early is also a great idea. Um, if you can have a rolling deadline so that it's built in for everybody, okay, you know, this is the day that I would like it to be turned in. Let's make sure it's turned in the following Friday. Um, and letting students know that you're still accepting their work and that um, you still want to see if they're doing, if they understand those concepts or uh, if they are able to, if they've worked on those skills that you are, that you're looking for. Um, because not being able to meet a deadline doesn't mean that the students don't know the, the content. Um, so if we're thinking about ways to ensure that students are getting what they need to from our classes, uh, having that leniency built in is, is useful. That doesn't mean that you're not moving on um, in class, but that means that you are, are recognizing, again, that they have uh, their own responsibilities and uh, other things going on in their lives. Um, more and more we're seeing people also accepting um, work that is revised and resubmitted, not only in writing classes, but in other classes as well. So it might be, okay, you can revise and resubmit one assignment. Uh, you can retake this exam. Um, but it allows us to see if students are actually understanding concepts better after we're giving them feedback. Um, and it also gives students the opportunity if they were rushed into completing something, they got sick, the technology wasn't working, they can then go back and say, no, I actually do understand this thing or, oh, you know, I misunderstood the directions and and here's what here's what I have now that I understand this a little bit better. Um, if we're giving them opportunities to demonstrate their understanding, um, instead of giving them, you know, five exams, giving them opportunity to redo one um, and check their understanding along the way, see if those those foundational concepts have uh, sunk in in a different way or that they understand the way that you give exams now. Um, that can be really vital. Representation and materials is another way that we can think about uh, equity. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, students are coming in with these diverse identities and experiences and backgrounds. And so acknowledging that in class, uh, is is huge to a lot of students. Um, if we can incorporate course materials that acknowledge their uh, identities that come from people uh, with experiences and um, identities like theirs, that's amazing. Um, if we can do have some representation in experts or guest speakers, uh, that's also an option. Um, but even if the materials for your course, the readings, um, the data sets that you're looking at don't necessarily match the identities of your students in the class, at least acknowledging, oh, um, this research was done and they, they, uh, they didn't include this identity and I wonder if that would be different or acknowledging, um, that that's a shortcoming in the field. Um, if you are um, unable to have uh, materials that are coming from uh, a wide background, 
just acknowledging that um, and acknowledging that you are working on it more or that the field needs more work uh, is, is a big deal too. Um, so if it's a survey thing, it doesn't take this into account or uh, that um, academics in the field don't necessarily uh, match the diversity of, of the working field, um, that the different perspectives haven't been included. Uh, all of that is, is a good place to start, especially if you can't incorporate uh, new material materials in right now, um, or if you're having a hard time finding materials that, um, again, are coming from a diverse background. When we are creating course uh, policies, when we're thinking about how we're going to manage our classes and how uh, what our expectations are for our students, um, that's a big way that we might be thinking we're creating um, neutral policies that handwriting uh, notes is the best way forward. Um, you know, studies have shown this. Uh, it's disruptive for students to leave to use the restroom in the middle of class, um, whatever it is. Um, taking a step back and thinking about whether uh, you might have students in your class that need those things. So if they need access to a computer, um, whether it's for uh, transcription services, cart services, uh, whether it's for them to be able to take notes um, or to follow along with the with the course materials and interact with your PowerPoint or with the readings in a different way. Um, or because you asked everybody to print the readings, but not everybody has money to do that. Um, allowing technology in the classroom can be huge and can also be something that um, doesn't force students into a situation where they're embarrassed explaining why they need their computer, um, either, whether it's to you or to their, their classmates. Um, allowing students to access restrooms, food, and drink um, is, is huge. You might have students with, uh, with disabilities that have that in their letters that they need to be able to leave the, the classroom um and drink and eat as necessary some classrooms are not going to be appropriate for somebody to be drinking or eating um but allowing them to know where they can do that safely um and not trying to manage people's bodies by saying you can't leave um during this uh this moment in class um that is huge if there's something where it would be helpful for them to be in for a stretch of time giving you know students a five minute warning oh hey at 11 30 we're going to be doing this thing so if any of you need to stretch now use the bathroom whatever uh you can build that into that day um but trying not to restrict students access to uh their basic needs uh is is super helpful um being lenient with absences and tardiness uh again some students with disabilities uh might need that leniency but also there are so many students that cannot get documentation for disabilities there are so many students with chronic illnesses and pain that don't necessarily qualify um for for that documentation or for that protection so uh creating opportunities for uh students to have communication with you about those things instead of uh, shutting them down from the beginning of the semester is a really great way to demonstrate that you care uh, for your students, but also that you are um, that you're not holding it against them um, if they have needs that are going to lead to them not being in class. And then also giving them opportunities to participate and to engage 
in multiple ways. We have some students that are um, not comfortable speaking up. We have some students that uh, might have great anxiety over uh, speaking in front of the whole class, but maybe in a small group, that would be something that they're comfortable doing. Um, maybe asking students to go around and jot down a few notes and then collecting slips of paper and reading those off to everybody. Uh, maybe it's everybody doing a little reflection at the end of class. Uh, there are multiple ways to get students to engage and to demonstrate that they understand what's going on or that they're process processing the information at the very least. Um, so creating those opportunities for, for students to engage in those different ways and to demonstrate that they are, um, that they're listening and that they're uh, working toward uh, whatever you want them to be working toward. Uh, that's, those are great opportunities for, again, for students to know that you don't necessarily think that they are um, disengaged because they're not speaking, um, but maybe allowing them the extra time to process information or um, the opportunity to ask questions in a, in a space that feels a little bit more safe. Um, just building that into your expectations is, is super great. And that, so that might be the way that you are grading engagement or participation or whether you're grading those at all. Okay, so I spoke a lot. Um, so I'm curious about your experiences. So um, I'm gonna give you a, a chance to ask me questions too, but I would love for you all to, uh, to again, speak from your experiences. So uh, what are some of the ways that you've made your courses more equitable? Might be representation, policies, materials, assessment, could even be Blackboard design. And I'm curious, what are some of the challenges that you've encountered with equity? Um, again, it could be like the design of your course. It could be uh, something that you received and feedback from the students, strain on your time. Um, because again, these uh, changing all of this stuff actually does take time and takes a lot of effort in addition to all of the other things that we're doing. Um, so yeah, anybody have anything? You can either turn on your uh, mic and show that way, or if you want to pop something in the chat, that's fine too. What are we doing well? Flexible deadlines. Do you build that in from um, the beginning of class into the schedule or does that happen as needed? Okay. Does anybody else do flexible deadlines? That's great because not everybody attends every class. So then having it built into all of the course materials is, is a great way to demonstrate that like this is intentional. Um, I do somewhat flexible deadlines. Um, I'm not sure if it's as flexible as, as you were thinking, but I do tell students that if they need an extension, I'll give them at least one 48 hour extension with like no questions asked. If they just tell me they need it, I'll give it to them. Um, and then I also say, if you're if you talk with me about why you can't meet a deadline, you know, I, I may extend the deadline um, to try to encourage I put that on the syllabus and I announced it just to try to encourage them to be in communication with me um, instead of just oh, I just won't do it or something. I love the automatic, you don't need to tell me anything, 48 hours, uh, because sometimes 
that's the difference between somebody sleeping and not. Um, that's how I like to think about a lot of things for my classes. Uh, it's like, okay, well, if I give you 24 more hours, is that going to mean that you get to sleep? It probably is. I want you to sleep. Like that's a, I want you to sleep. I want you to eat. I want you to be able to, you know, like rest your mind for a while. Yes, absolutely. And I also like the communication being built into, uh, as a, an additional option because, um, well, there's this balance between students uh, feeling that they have to tell us uh, a lot of information, which is not necessarily true, um, but it instills this idea of like communication as being such a big part of lives <laughs> because you're going to need it in your jobs. You're going to need it in the rest of your academic career. Um, so, yeah, I really like both of those options. Thank you. Um, yeah. Let me see. In terms of challenges, I'm uncertain how to balance accommodating students in this manner versus holding them accountable. Yeah. Um, it seems the more I accommodate, the more I'm impeding their growth as students. I think that one of the, I don't have an, I don't have an answer um, to that. Uh, you weren't asking me to, to answer that either, but um, one of the things that I like to think about is whether um, you're asking them to grow in a way that makes sense for the class or whether you're assuming that they need to do X, Y, Z things to grow in order to be a student or to be a professional in the field. Um, and so if it's something um, I've heard from people that in like nursing, for example, um, you might build in um, extensions into assignments in a way that they have to submit uh, paperwork as if they were going to take a sick day from, from their job. Um, so you're in this class, you're gonna be a professional in the field. So you're going to ask for extra time. You're gonna ask for a day off. You need to uh, submit this, this paperwork as if you were in this field. Um, but it is, it's a hard balance um, trying to figure out if, uh, if, if it's unreasonable to ask for X, Y, Z things, or if you, you should be uh, openly giving them to, uh, to students. And sometimes uh, it also will impede on your free time and your mental health too, if you give too many extensions towards the end of the semester. Um, yeah, that's something that I'm, still uh, growing on, still trying to figure out, and 100% comes down to uh, personally what you believe the class to be about and what you believe uh, works for students too, because some structure is, is always going to be good. Um, yeah, window of due dates uh, can help with that for sure. Um, I've incorporated quite a few of these strategies, including flexible deadlines. Um, I also break down larger assignments into smaller components. Love that. Um, with check-ins, yeah. And then feedback, which can be a lot of work to Michelle um, to continuously give feedback, but also will really help students stay on track and meet those final deadlines that are necessary again for them, but also for, for you. Yeah. And I would say like, I, I have done this for a couple of years now and the dramatic impact that I think it's had on such a wide variety of my students, um, helping them understand that cause it's, I do education courses. So teaching my students to take risks, be vulnerable, um, in their work is really important to me um, because I think it's part of the learning process, right? So I feel like the more opportunities I give them to 
demonstrate like what they know um, and, and let them know that it's okay that they don't get it right the first time. And to have those conversations about why maybe we would, what things we would change or what are some things that they're doing really well is, is super important. So I feel like it is a lot more effort on my part, but I, I do feel like it's been really beneficial for my students. Yeah, that's amazing. I, uh, yeah. And again, it's, it's more effort. It can take more time. Um, which is one of the reasons why if we're designing the course with this sort of thing in mind, we can then figure out what's the most important thing to do. Uh, how can we incorporate this assessment or, uh, break down these components in a way that makes sense that, uh, doesn't make students do busy work, but it also doesn't put a bunch of uh, work on our plates that is is unreasonable. Um, Nick says that he's doing, um, well, the whole group of TAs are doing a limited revision, um, and that is worked really well for a student, which is awesome. Um, if you're teaching four or five writing classes, unlimited might um, might feel like a lot, but also not many students take uh, take that policy and run with it. So uh, that's something to figure out too. Is is that balance of of offering? Um, what are you offering, and and why, and how can you keep track of that stuff too? Um, Exit slips. I love exit slips uh, and giving them an opportunity to give feedback, think about what they've learned. And um, you can also see what's not sticking. Yeah. Technology in the classroom. I could, I could yeah, say more really about, oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say I could say more about what I'm thinking if you want. Yeah. Um, okay, so I I have heard things along the lines of what you said about, um, well, some students really need their devices so that they can take notes. And, you know, we don't want to make students feel self-conscious or embarrassed if they need that. And so I ended my policy of saying no laptops or phones. But ever since I ended it, now many of my students just stare at their phones during class time. Um, mm. I mean, this uh, this has been a problem two different semesters, and um, I I'm I feel like well, it's not working. Whatever I'm doing is not working because I I don't think that's good for the majority of students to be staring at their phones. But I don't know what to do except to forbid technology unless students ask for an exception. Yeah. Um, so I've heard a couple different policies. Um, I have heard from um, somebody else. I can't remember where they are from the university, but they were saying that they have um, phone breaks in class where it'd be like, okay, here, you know, like for the next, 60 seconds, you can look at your phone and then it needs to go away. Or um, I've heard from other people of having these specific times where it's like, okay, uh, we're just having discussion. No, no devices out. We're just talking. Um, and so the devices only come out when you're actively doing like writing, note taking, or when you're looking at maybe resources online. So being very specific about how how they're using them and when they're using them um, might be options, but it's it's hard to balance that. Yeah, I I understand. Yeah, I think that some of these things like, in a perfect world we would do this, but also it's not always like from class to class. Some students might um, the the energy in some rooms might be more let's let's be on our, our phones and doing this and the other energy in your class following that might be different. So, um, so yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I don't think I'm the only one who's having a problem with this, with yeah. students being on their phones. Um, yeah, it, it, it is kind of a problem, I think. I think since the pandemic, it's just a lot worse. I'm, yeah. Um, and I think that that's also maybe something too with like deciding which technology students are allowed to use too, being like, okay, we're, you know, like if you need something to assist with, uh, um, with note taking or whatever, this is what you're going to use. These are the, you know, and being very specific about like what windows should be open in there, um, on their devices and whatnot too, uh, which is, feels micromanaging and feels icky too. Um, it but does. from what I've seen is if people, uh, are pretty like clear about those policies from day one, it's, it becomes an expectation, but it also can be like, um, it can be hard. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Of course. Um, let me see. Um, shared assignments, asking students not to ghost you. Um, that's hilarious and also um, would be a very cute thing to put in a syllabus. Um, examples of flexible language uh, for attendance and due dates. Uh, and Melissa is sharing some. Awesome. I can also uh, share some examples of what that might look like too um, in the after email after this, uh, this session ends um, to give you all some, some ideas of what that might sound like and um, what other people are, are doing and saying. Yeah. Um, let me see. I appreciate all of your, uh, all of your input. And, uh, I love that all of these techniques that you all are using, like, again, scaffolding things, being like just very direct in your communication with students and the expectations, um, that you have for them, like that is creating an equitable environment, not assuming that they're going to know um, what your expectations are um, is, is huge. Um, before we end, um, is there any, any last questions that I can help answer? Um, anything else that would be useful for me to send along with resources uh, once we end in a couple minutes? Okay. As questions or concerns come up, let me know. Um, Are you going to share the, the PowerPoint? Um, so I will share uh, all of the resources for the PowerPoint. Um, if you specifically want the PowerPoint, uh, Alicia, I will send that to you. Um, I will also send out the link to this recorded uh, presentation as well. So. Um, yeah, I can send those resources out to to all of you. Thank you. Any other? Of course, of course. Um, well, thank you all for coming. I'm so happy uh, to have had all of you here today. Uh, thanks for thanks for being here. Let me know uh, again as questions and concerns come up. Um, feel free to uh, reach out to me. Um, and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. You'll get an email from me very soon. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you again.